Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Patrice Petro, and I am here with Kristen Whistle, Professor of Film and Media Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, we're going to discuss special effects in Mad Max Fury Road. So, to begin, on the level of pure craft, Fury Road is truly impressive, and we'll come back to this. Uh, director George Miller actually promoted the film as using very few computer-generated images and digital, digital visual effects. But of course, most of the shots in the film involve, involve some sort of digital, digital visual effect. The toxic uh, sandstorm, for instance, is mostly computer generated. So how do you see the relationship between craft and digital and visual effects in this film? I mean, and, and why would the director want to insist on craft and, and try to make it seem as if effects were minimal. Were minimal. I think in, in some respects, from the material that I've read, he wanted the film to um, kind of evoke a past era. That's why he has like muscle cars and um, it's supposed to have a, a very kind of mechanical look. Like, this is a kind of post-computer world. And so he wanted the effects to kind of have that kind of material in-camera special effects look that the earlier films had. Um, and so they try to do as many in-camera stunts as possible um, and to do, you know, some of the, uh, the stunts like the fights on top of the moving vehicles um, in camera as well. Um, and, uh, and so, I mean, I think if, if you think about the sort of relationship between the digital effects and the in-camera stunts, um, uh, like maybe like the polecats would be right. a really good example. So um, the polecats are the, the guys swinging back and forth on, on, the, on the poles. Um, those, he really wanted those to be in camera sort of physical stunts. And so um, they sort of devised a rig um, so that, um, you know, stuntmen could sort of be trained to ride these back and forth. And so, um, you know, eventually they sort of shot um, those, you know, those images of the guys moving back and forth, and they were then composited onto moving vehicles. So those sort of, um, those long shots of them in the distance where you kind of see them going back and forth, and then some of the other physical stunts as well, when they move from car to car, um, those are composited into to the image. So you have physical effects, but they're sort of digitally composited into the other, other images. So that kind of relationship um, pretty much obtains throughout the entire film. A lot of the um, uh, shots that you think, you know, you're sort of watching a moving vehicle are actually shot on a gimbal rig and a, a, a travel simulation rig. Mm -hmm. um, and the vehicles aren't moving at all. Um, they're sort of being sort of moved and you know, so the way that the camera is moving and sometimes there will be other vehicles moving sort of slowly by, um, it creates, you know, a sense of movement. Of course, like their wind is, is being produced and, and sand. Um, and then uh, those elements are again sort of composited into mm -hmm. a moving background. And I think, you know, once you know that and you're watching the film, it becomes more visible. But certainly if you don't and the first time you see the film, they're, they're really invisible. I mean, it's, a, it's very impressive um, how dynamic those scenes are, given that they're sort of composited from different elements, many of which aren't moving at all. As we were getting ready to come out here tonight, you said that this is the first time you've seen the film in, uh, in, in 2D. 2D and uh, flat, uh, and, yes. And flat, not in 3D. Could you talk a little bit about what, it, following up from what you just said, what difference that makes? Um, so, you know, in, in 3D, I feel as if the world looks stranger and, and, and sort of thematically that goes sort of very well with the idea that this is a kind of post-apocalyptic landscape. Mm -hmm. um, the bodies are all, like bodies are generally more sort of sculptural, right, in 3D and so there is a sort of much greater emphasis um, on bodies and you, they stand out a lot more. Mm -hmm. and. Um, um, you know, the way that um, bodies compare to one another is, is really kind of interesting and important in the film as well. The sublime landscapes and the kind of void of the salt um, flats are yeah, much more expansive. And then, of course, when they're going through the canyon, 
that's really kind of harrowing. Mm -hmm. um, it really feels very sort of claustrophobic. And each of the, the sort of rock formations kind of, they really stand out on their own. And so there's a way that the landscape is made even stranger than it already is um, in here. And bodies are also stranger. Oh, interesting. Well, obviously this isn't a literary or cerebral film. And it's uncluttered by backstory, subplots, and moral quandaries that bring so many contemporary action movies to a grinding halt. Mm -hmm. Dialogue, obviously, is scant, and exposition all but non-existent. Can you say more about the relationship between narrative and spectacle in this film? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, I think rather than having a narrative, I mean, it is very much about moving from here to there, mm -hmm. and then there's no there there, so you go back to here again. Um, so the narrative itself, I think, is really conceptual, and I've always sort of thought of it in terms of, you know, that movement, but then related to three sort of different characters and their relationship to time, because this is a movie about, you know, after the apocalypse, and so here it is after the apocalypse, so what next? Um, and so, um, you know, I think of the narrative in terms of, you know, Max begins um, the story, um, he is running from the past. He's running from the living and the dead. Um, and, you know, sort of because of that, um, especially because he, he's running from the living, because he is healthy, he doesn't have cancer, and he's a universal donor, he's a commodity. I mean, he's really, really very valuable, like other healthy people in the mm -hmm. film. Um, and so he is sort of continually sort of running, right? He's being pursued, and stasis is death for him or capture. Um, and so he lives in this kind of perpetual present, this now this, now this, now this. Um, Furiosa um, thinks she's headed to a new future, right, with these mothers, with these pregnant young women. And of course, um, pregnant women have always um, sort of they bear the burden of futurity. They represent right. the future um, very much. Um, and she's sort of like driving towards this future, but it turns out it's the past. Like when we find out it's the, the sort of green place of the many mothers, it sounds just as mythological as Valhalla right. is um, in the film. And so, um, so she's really kind of m driving towards uh, the past. And really it's Nux and the war boys who have this kind of, future that they're driving towards. It's death, it's a, like the death drive. Um, and for them, it's I live, I die, I, I live again. Um, and all of these kind of temporalities are kind of, you know, moving forward together with, with these vehicles. So that to me is what like the narrative is really about. And you get a little bit of insight into the characters, but you don't know much more than that. Um, you know, the relationship then to spectacle, spectacle comes in in terms of, uh, as obstacles, right, to the, this kind of forward progression, this movement through space that's also a kind of movement through time. And I think that the toxic sandstorm is a really good way of thinking about the relationship between spectacle and narrative. It is this kind of inexorable, sort of massive, um, weather system. I mean, I don't even know what you would call mm -hmm. it. Um, but if you remember, right before they drive in, um, Morton Joe looks at his compass and it's spinning. And it's mm -hmm. really a kind of void in the sense of no space, no time. Um, and, um, you know, Furiosa is just, she puts on her goggles, right? And she's just driving through and not stopping. Um, Nux is trying to kill himself, right? So he can right. go to Valhalla so that he can stop her. Um, and, um, and Max is just trying to stay alive, right? He's just trying to stop Nux from killing himself and, and Furiosa. And all, you know, this chase is sort of so exhausting. It's spectacular. It's kind of hyperkinetic. And at the same time, you have these, you know, massive tornadoes um, mm -hmm. sort of whirling around them. And so how they manage to get through that storm, you know, keeps the narrative moving and these different timelines going. Um, but at the same time, there is this, this kind of, you know, they, they have to move through this, like, incredibly dense, um, toxic sandstorm. Um, and there's that, like, amazing moment when, you know, she sort of pushes, edges the car, uh, the war boy's car over into one of the tornadoes, and they just sort of get sucked up into the vortex. 
In your book, Spectacular Digital Effects, you employ the concept of digital effects emblems. Um, and you say that spectacular CGI often functions as an effects emblem that give expression to key themes, anxieties, and desires in both in the films they appear in and the historical moments in which they're made. Can you say more about this concept? Um, from what I read, it seems that emblems rely heavily on dialogue and narrative uh, to function in the, in the films in which they appear. So how would this work in Fury Road for like, you? Are there effects emblems? emblems? Because they're so... Um, the dialogue is so yeah. scant and the narrative is, is yeah, so I mean, I think if, if there is a kind of way that, um, that the visual effects are functioning emblematically, I think it has to do with this kind of um, the way that home um, and trying to find a home um, is, is a kind of structuring theme in the film. Um, and so, um, again, you know, we think we're moving towards the green place, which is a, a kind of lost home. Um, and each of these obstacles that sort of gets in the way is, is sort of, you know, quite sort of spectacular. Um, but I think probably um, it, it, in the end, I mean, the, this kind of difficulty of, of finding a home, right, even to make the world habitable, right, right. and home-like for, for human life, um, is, I think, one of the sort of larger arguments that the film is making, right? That there, there's, there is no home at all. But the Citadel, it seems to me, sort of um, is this place that, you know, she flees. Um, and then, you know, sort of once you realize that the green place of the many mothers doesn't actually exist, um, and he suggests going back, well, that's actually a green place of many mothers. Right. Um, it, it's, it's where she started out. And so, um, it seems to me that like that the citadel itself and all of those sort of effect shots of sort of moving up and down um, kind of represent the way that this um, it's almost as if um, the natural world has been turned into a factory um, but the way that that comes to represent um, something that could become a home mm -hmm. even though it is just it's it's nature and industry it seems sort of unhomelike right, right. Um, and yet yeah, but it's, it's a, what they have, right. um, and, it, and it, it creates the, it, I guess it has the conditions of possibility for home. Mm -hmm. Well, George Miller has been hailed as a master of the horizontal in <laughs> cinema, um, the master of the chase and the movement of cars and trucks speeding across landscapes. You've written about the tension between verticality and horizontality in structures of contemporary blockbusters and superhero comic adaptations. You say, for instance, and I quote you, precisely because verticality automatically implies the intersection of two opposed forces, gravity and the force required to overcome it, it is an ideal technique for visualizing power. Can you say more about what, how you see verticality and the ways in which power is visualized in, in Mad Max Fury Road? Because think, it seems like, yeah. so, it, it, at first glance, you'd say this is such a horizontal, horizontal film, yeah. and yet, as you've just described, the Citadel yeah. as at once a factory and somewhat in nature. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and the horizontal always has to do with time because of the horizon. Um, and, and I think the Citadel, that, that sort of opening scene with Immort and Joe, like really kind of perfectly emblematizes that. I mean, you, when you see Max and he's running away from the war boys, you think you're underground, right? And then he suddenly emerges out onto the edge of this cliff and looks down, almost falls, you know, sort of looks up and then is truly astonished, not when he looks down to see how high he is, but when he sees green mm -hmm. um, up at the top. Um, and I think really, um, you know, if you think about the way that the Citadel is described and, and represented, I mean, he has power, Morton Joe has power because he, he pumps water up from deep, you know, from up above the earth um, and, um, and controls water um, and is able to sort of, you know, sort of keep all of these resources fortified um, inaccessibly sort of at the top of these buttes. Right. Um, and so it's, it, it, it's not just that he has access to these resources, but they're inaccessible. Um, even the sort of cars, right, are sort of brought up and down right. on that pulley system. Um, and what's sort of really interesting is the way that um, 
he exercises his power is very sort of medieval, right? It's like um, he, you know, he sort of goes out in front of the crowd um, and, um, you know, he's sort of, you know, he claims that he's their redeemer. It's very sort of, you know, religious. Um, but the way that he kind of displays power in a, in a medieval sort of way is this release of water, right, in these sort of massive cascade that is so wasteful, right? But the point isn't to actually provide water. It's simply to demonstrate his control of water and his power over it. And so, you know, it's this kind of, you know, drawing the water up and then sort of spilling it out so wastefully, um, you know, is, is this kind of perfect representation of, of his control of these resources and, and of human resources as well. And he even says, don't get used to the water and right. become addicted to it. Right, he calls um, it aqua cola. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, who killed the world is the question plaintively asked during the film. Um, the answer is obviously toxic masculinity, but does this make it a feminist film? And what is the interest in toxic masculinity? Just as a sidebar, in May 2015, just before the film's initial release, a men's right advocate called it a feminist piece of propaganda posing as a guy flick. Uh, so can we talk a little bit? So confusing. I, it is very confusing. I wondered what your thoughts were um, about that. It, you know, the whole kind of, at once, yeah. we're, we're repelled by this toxic masculinity, right. but there's also this fascination, as we were yeah. saying, you know, with the, you know, dirt bikes and the big rigs and the, you know, it's a kind of world. Um, right. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of these films that, like, critiques at the same time that it, it kind of promotes a fascination with what it's critiquing. And so, um, I mean, who, who killed the world? It would, it would seem that it would be a, a certain kind of, bellicose form of patriarchal capitalism. And the world that's being represented is a really distilled um, version mm -hmm. of that, um, knocked back several centuries. Um, and so you have like the Bullet Farm and Gastown um, and, and Morton Joe who has wa water. Um, and so I, you know, I, th I think that, um, you know, the, the film is definitely critiquing that, and you mentioned in the introduction that, you know, it's, they're just sort of trafficking in gas and weapons and, and human beings and, and natural resources. Um, so it, it's, it's hard to, I mean, it's hard for me to think of this as a feminist film because it, it you know, it, it does sort of promote a kind of fascination with um, the war boys and the speed that's associated with it and this kind of, um, death drive, I suppose, um, as well. Um, so, yeah, I'm not really sure, you know. It doesn't need to be a, a yeah. feminist film or, or not. I not. mean, but I love that there's this reaction to it that, you know, with these fe pseudo-feminist themes throughout, in, right. you know, in, in various ways we could talk about that are fairly obvious, and yet, like you said, the fascination, it, we're both fascinated and repelled by things. It could even be yeah. the scene when, when um, uh, Max catches up with the initially with the war rig and all of a sudden sees these scantily clad, absolutely right. beautiful white women yeah. hosing themselves down. You know, right, it's right. not exactly yes. maybe a Brian De Palma notion of feminism, right, right, but not ours. Um, yeah, I mean, and I think, I mean, there was also quite a bit of discussion around you know the fact that Charlie Theron is you know really an action hero in this movie and. Um, you know, she's the best driver and the best shooter. Um, and, you know, there was a way that that was also kind of um, lauded as being sort of feminist. Um, but at the same time, I do think that the film really kind of over-associates women with home and motherhood in ways that um, I'm not sure are feminist at all. Um, right. And, and so, it, it, again, it sort of seems to me one of these films where you can find sort of critiques here and there, um, but at the same time, you know, there are in equal measure sort of super problematic moments, like the wet t-shirt moment. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, I was wondering if, uh, one, uh, an article that I read by Mackenzie Wark, it was when the film came out, I think I, I came across it by chance and I thought it was really smart. And there she writes about how the film is really organized around four fluids. Mm -hmm. um, even what's the Max's first line? I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a blood or so. Right. The, yeah, yeah. So the four fluids are blood and oil and mm -hmm. water and milk, and mm -hmm. they're heavily gendered. 
kind of term, so that blood and oil are very masculine controlled, um, and um, you know, water and milk are associated with the women and a more a, a kind of, but these are the resources of this world. These are the fluids. Yeah. This is the, this is what runs the world mm -hmm. and who controls these resources. Controls the world. Controls the world. I wondered if yeah. you had some thoughts about that and it's, it's views of kind of fluids and power and yeah. environmental. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's interesting. I, I sort of feel like, um, You know, one, not just fluids, I mean, I really do sort of feel like it's also sort of health, right, and able bodies mm -hmm. that, um, that are also being controlled, um, sort of along with those things. And so, um, um, yeah. I, I, well, maybe you could switch it over. Another way of thinking about the same question is to say, you know, how does disability figure in the right. film? Um, you know, all of the characters, most of the characters, all of the characters are crippled in one way or another. Right. Um, there are those who are compromised by, you know, fleshy mm -hmm. excess, and you know, Charlize Theron with the missing forearm, and um, mm -hmm. the you know the characters are cyborgs, a mixture of flesh mm -hmm. and tech. So how you yeah. know is disability figured in the film? And I think that's a really interesting question because I think um, the film wants you to think about disabled bodies and the landscape, the damage that's been done to the landscape as similar as, you know, sort of it tied to one another. Um, and so um, sort of, you know, the kind of collapse of ecosystems and then the, the collapse of the human body um, are really kind of inseparable. And I think the seeing like the two headed lizard at the, at the beginning right. sort of forces you then to sort of to see um, uh, all of these bodies that have been disabled because of environmental contamination, and then to see, you know, the sort of world as a body that's been um, contaminated and, and disabled as well. Um, and so, um, and then the, the other side to that is that it then sort of foregrounds the way that able bodies are really fetishized and have become commodities and, and resources that are exploited and, and traded. Um, and, and, and in some respects that, you know, is inseparable from um, the way that the women are represented in, in the film. I mean, they are able-bodied and healthy. They don't have cancer, which is why they're the prized breeders. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they are sort of commodifiable or con controlled objects. I mean, he, Morton Joe, calls them his property and mm -hmm. calls the, the, you know, the unborn baby his property. Um, precisely because health itself is such a, a rare natural resource um, that that he's exploiting. So I think thinking those three things together, the way that gender politics and feminism is related to sort of um, eco-politics and the representation of this kind of destroyed climate this, or this, just, this destroyed environment, um, and then sort of back again to, to disabled bodies. But even the disabled bodies can be, you know, I mean, it's hard to believe that people, that this, these, some of these characters actually survive some of right. the, you know, the mashups that happen. It, it's like it takes a lot to kill somebody. Right, yes, yeah, <laughs> and even when they really want to die. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Um, but in, in terms of, like, the technology and body cyborgs, I mean, um, you know, what, what, thinking about that, um, I mean, I've always sort of seen that, that as um, kind of part of the way that uh, Morton Joe, tr you know, sort of treats all of these people who he basically owns as tools. And so, you know, all of these technologies are used to enhance, like, the capabilities of bodies, their abilities to sort of work more mm -hmm. um, or to sort of enhance perception. Um, but each of them is branded, um, and he has like instrumentalized all of these bodies um, as a way of kind of enhancing his power and his control. Um, and and so like the cyborg thing, I think really has to do with the often with marking these bodies as having the status of, of objects or tools that are just kind of extensions or instruments of his power. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you would say a little bit about the production history of this film. I've read that uh, Miller wanted to make it before 9-11 and then didn't have the resources to make it. Mm -hmm. um, 
a number of Australian film critics, I'm thinking of Adrian Martin, but certainly of Megan Morris wrote uh, about the Mad Max trilogy or mm -hmm. individual installments. Mm -hmm. And Megan really emphasized how she saw George Miller's quest that somehow bound up with the films is not just this fascination with toxic ma masculinity, but this desire for indigeneity. And in an Australian context that hmm. the Charlize Theron character says it once, you know, I was born, I was born in the Sounds green boring. world, you know, but I was taken, um, you know, as if in the Australian story, as if she's a kind of emblem for the indigenous Oh. people who were taken from their families and right but only here it's I see. you know that indigeneity is kind of erased i think it is i mean you don't yeah. see an indigenous person until the very end of the film right. um and so um i mean in terms of the production history i think i probably know yeah. i've read this the, the same, same that, that you have um I, you know i i know that he couldn't film it in Australia. Um, so it was actually shot on location in Nam Namibia right. because Australia was too green. Uh, it, they were having sort of like yeah. the opposite problem with um, climate change, right? There was too much rain. Um, and so the, the landscape wasn't sort of void of life enough. And so they had to move um, production to Namibia so that they could have that kind of really desert, um, kind of blown out landscape, but also have those sort of really kind of uh, distant stretches, right, where there's nothing to see, you know, for 10 miles until you, you see the horizon line. Yes, it's just, it's interesting because I think, you know, if we think about a visual effects emblem mm -hmm. in terms of how you've argued about it or thinking about the film in terms of indigeneity and its fascination in a kind of post-apocalyptic world in a landscape where everyone is displaced from mm -hmm. somewhere else. Right, that's right. And yet, you know, it still carries that baggage, I think, when I was really struck when, when um, uh, the Furiosa character becomes this emblem of the abductive Aboriginal child. child. Right, right, yeah. yeah. Who ha really has no home then, right? I mean, right. it's just kind of searching for that. Right. Um, and, and only has this sort of vague memory um, of, of a home that no longer exists, that's basically been destroyed. Well, and it's also, you know, I think of the comment, you know, sh that they're looking, that the, the, the women are looking for hope, but uh, uh, Furiosa is looking for redemption. And, right. and um, even Nook at one point says, hope, that sounds good to me, but of course, in terms of your discussion of temporality, his is all about a future orientation. Uh -huh. you know, so right. hope, hope brings with him, whereas yes. redemption. Could you say more about that? About the, re the redemption thing. I mean, it's, I wondered about that for a while, but you know, I, I think once you sort of see you know, the, the sort of uh, the, the mothers that he, she's sort of been searching for, um, the redemption, I think, comes from the fact that she's had to kill, that, the, that her life has become this. She's been driving the war rig, she's been with the war boys, and um, she's obviously had to kill people. She's really, really good at it. Um, and so, um, you know, her need for redemption is similar, I think, to Max's, where, you know, he's looking for redemption because he's clearly been unable to save people um, from being killed. Um, and so, um, you know, I sort of see it as that, as a kind of loss of, of innocence, a kind of corruption, um, and a, a kind of desire to, um, to, to sort of escape that, right? To escape that life um, where she is, again, like an instrument of this kind of um, exploitative power, basically. Well, I think, too, of the line where um, uh, Max says to her, um, if you can't fix things that are broken, you'll go insane. Right. And, and of course, the whole movie's about fixing, constantly fixing broken things. And in fact, this is a world, it's already a broken world that's made up of things that are fixed. I'll, I'll, or yeah. Jimmy Rigged or <laughs> MacGyvered. Anyways, we'll come back to that. But I wanted to just touch again on the, the whole mythical green world that is kind right. of the, the, the end point of the quest, or at least is thought to be at the beginning, the quest for this space. Um, and you said it's as, it's as um, illusory and utopian as Valhalla. Right. Um, but what are we to make of the film's ending and the possibility of a green world? Yeah. I mean, with this return at the end. I think it, it, I mean, the suggestion is that it has to be made. It has to be remade and even taken. Um, and that it, you know, it, it, 
bears very little relationship to the past, that it has to be something new um, and different. Um, and, uh, you know, um, in, in a way kind of anti-mythological, um, the, the, the sort of vision of greenness that, that the Citadel offers, you know, are these kind of, right, like the rotating crops, the hydroponic crops that um, they're, they're growing with the use of this water and it, it, it isn't pastoral in any sort of way. It, it looks like, you know, you have like basically serfs, right? Sort of using biopower to sort of move these machines and move them forward. And so um, it's, it seems to be a, a kind of form of hope that is undefined at the end of the film. And I think it's, that's one of the things that I like about it is mm -hmm. that it isn't prescriptive. It rejects that kind of nostalgic return. Right. Um, and of course, the women now have the seeds. They have the seeds and the water <laughs> um, so as always, well. There's always possibility. Um, as a last question before we open up to the audience, I just wanted to have you reflect a little bit on our theme of, as I said at the opening, for our series on special effects, we wanted to get beyond the, the conventional notion, although we've delivered it for you here tonight, of mm -hmm. uh, CGI and computer-generated imagery and effects to think more complicated ways about effects without saying, well, all of cinema is a special effect, which of course is also true. But I mean, okay, it's a... It, it is, but... but <laughs> so we wanted to really focus on craft. And um, for myself, I'm someone who's written about hoarding and trash and repurposing, and it's mm -hmm. always struck me that Fury Road, for all of its emphasis on the post-apocalyptic destruction of the, of the world, is also and kind of fundamentally about human ingenuity. Right. Uh, the ability to live beyond the so-called end of the world, beyond the dismal prospects of peak oil. Could you, could you say more about that? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the set design, the design of, of all of these machines is, is really fascinating. Is There's fast. a kind of like fascinating bricolage there, totally. right? Um, like the using the gas pedal to be the the measurer for you know the foot measurer. I mean, there, and right. there's a there's a way that um, that the way all of these different sort of technologies are being cobbled together um, to sort of um, uh, you know increase you know their their capacities and their you know the amount of time that they survive is visually sort of really um, interesting and it does sort of suggest this kind of um, you know, ingenuity around survival. Exactly. Um, that, that's sort of really interesting. Um, and I think they're also, there, there's a way that they're really kind of uncanny technologies because of that, sort of when you, it's a car, but it's not a car, or it's right. a truck and it's not a truck. And it's one of the ways that the, the old world, the past, kind of haunts the present. Um, things that from the past are there and they're recognizable. Um, but they're not being used in the way that we, you know, we use them, and so they're they're sort of being defamiliarized, and it's a, just another one of the ways that I think like the the past is haunting the present in this film. Um, nobody can really sort of get away from it, even like the satellite, right? That looks right, like a shooting say, star. Right. Um, so I think that's really interesting, and then but then there's also a kind of certain point, like if you think back to the beginning of the film, it's precisely that kind of technological ingenuity that led to the invention of the combustion engine and right. the nuclear warhead. Right. Um, and it's, it seems in this world that it's headed in exactly the same direction. Um, and the film seems to suggest a possibility that that that's, mm -hmm. could be interrupted, that, that mm -hmm. you know, that the, the structure of history isn't also uncanny in the sense that we're gonna have this kind of recursive, you know, movement back to where technology um, and technological ingenuity um, will save us. Makes life easier, right. right? It makes the world habitable, but then kills the world again. Right. Well, I think we're ready to open up for questions in the audience. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, so it's so interesting that you talk about the film having this environmental uh, message saying that we need to save the world and there's such limited water that we're facing a crisis like that more and more every year. And it seems that this film itself uses thousands of gallons of fuel to do explosions and special effects. And I just wonder if the crew, or if you may know if anybody on the crew had any thought of that when they were creating this film. 
you know, I think that's a really good point. And um, I don't, I, I have no idea if the crew at all thought of that, but um, I mean, something that you're really pointing out that's um, important is that, you know, a lot of, I, like I think of this film as being an, a film about the Anthropocene, Anthropocene in the sense that you have a small cast of characters who are trying to just survive, right? And, um, in a world that's uninhabitable, and it's, you know, gravity is also like that, Life of Pi is like that. If you saw Arctic, it's, it's basically the same thing. It's just setting characters, you know, in these, these spaces that are entirely hostile to human life. Um, and it's a, it's a kind of way of dramatizing, I think, our current situation. Um, and what's interesting about all of these films um, is the amount of data that needs to be processed in order to make them and the render farms that need to, you know, to be the render times that need to be used in order to create these images are, of course, contributing to greenhouse gases. Um, and so there's a, you know, th there's a, a real kind of problem then um, with the way that um, these representations are, um, you know, are, are sort of asking us to sort of think about environment and climate um, while at the same time, you know, contributing to the, the, the problems that um, they're critiquing. Thank you for coming. Uh, one of the most striking things about Mad Max is the use of color, especially in what normally in a post-apocalyptic, you know, dull colors. This one's very vibrant and colorful and bold. Um, how hard is it for a coherent vision on all sets of production in terms of filming, in terms of craft, and especially with special effects that are invisible for it to all blend to a beautiful canvas that's colorful? Um, I know especially with special effects, it could be difficult when the colors and texture might not be perfect. Um, how important is it for the vision and how can that practically happen when you're working with so many different crews that are in charge of that and making it all uh, look visually pleasing. Yeah, I think I'm mostly that that kind of coherence that you're talking about, where um, you know, where sort of like the desert scenes have a you know a, a particular kind of color to them, and then um, those nighttime scenes, which you know, I think there's he he wants it to look like day for night right. shooting. Right. Um, which is really kind of interesting. And I'm sure you noticed that sort of the women are often, or they're holding like candlelight, and so you have this kind of monochromatic day for night kind of um, look to nighttime, but they're sort of golden and, and, and in color. Um, most of that's done in post-production. It's, it's done digitally. Um, uh, you know, so several passes um, will, will be taken to, to, you know, to illuminate the scenes. Um, in a way that is kind of like thematically and aesthetically coherent. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm enjoying the discussion. Uh, I, I don't have like a fully formed question, but I was wondering if you could speak to the pace of the film. Mm -hmm. As soon as it starts, like it doesn't really give you a second to catch your breath and um, you, you get sucked in and then it's like an adrenaline rush the entire way. Um, so maybe you can could you talk about maybe like the challenges in trying to create that type of film um, and how it works with the themes, how um, it might annoy or like, you know, kind of exhaust you after a while? It, it, it is. It is pretty exhausting, right? <laughs> I mean, um, I mean so, I, somebody like after the, the sandstorm sort of ends, like we saw somebody in front of us just was like, oh, you know, like it was just really exhausting. I mean, I think... Um, it's paced so that there, are, you know, the chase is like really, really intense, um, and and then suddenly it'll stop. So like right after the sandstorm, there is a kind of break, right? There's a, a lull, and you get sort of just enough dialogue to understand. But but before you get that dialogue, there's that fight as well. Um, so even though we're, we're sort of not moving kind of so hyperkinetically through space, there is still you know this kind of really suspenseful action. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 again, I sort of, um, you know, think of this as, um, you know, because it's a chase film um, and because it's, it's a road film, um, in order for the, the, the sort of narrative to sort of keep going, it has to keep 
moving at this kind of relentless, inexorable pace. Um, and I think of the, the kind of relationship between this like really intense um, action and then these moments where they just sort of stop as being like cutscenes in video games, um, where you, you kind of stop and it and just it, it just is arrested, um, and you get a little bit of narrative with dialogue and some character development. The plot gets filled out a little bit more. I mean, it's it's so minimal, um, and then it, it sort of starts again. Um, and um, you know, I I, I think that. Um, you know, the way that the, the film is sort of divided and like they go out, they find the green place which is no longer green and sort of go back. Um, you, you kind of know on the way back what to expect going through the canyon and there's a way that you kind of, it, there's a kind of reprise, right? You, you kind of go through the same sort of space again. Um, and, but at the same time, it's not repetitive. It doesn't really, um, seem as if you're sort of covering the same ground, um, even though like literally we actually are, um, simply because each, um, each sort of like progression through space, um, there's a kind of new obstacle. There are always sort of like new vehicles, um, you know, the polecats, which I, I think visually are, it's, they're so fascinating. Yeah. Um, there is this kind of, um, the, the way that the chases are choreographed and the way that directions in motion are choreographed so that you, you, know, you have this kind of these speeding vehicles and then the slow movement going this way and there's always, there's always like direction, movement in different opposing directions at different speeds in almost every shot. Um, so because you get that kind of variety, um, like in terms of where the attack is coming from, sometimes it's from above, sometimes it's from below, um, you do kind of get, uh, it kind of sustains its intensity um, without sort of seeming really uh, repetitive. Uh, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. Well, thank you very much. Please join me in thanking Professor Kristen Whistle for joining us. Thank you.